There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the presence of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. Thank you, Alice. We appreciate that. We've been reminded not only of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And our simple prayer then is that we would allow the Spirit of God, who is, by the way, the Spirit of truth, who works exclusively with the inscripturated Word of God. Our prayer is that we'd allow the Holy Spirit of God to do in our hearts and lives all that he desires to do. Let's pray that even now. Oh God, we are so thankful for your ongoing and great work in our lives. And much of it, amazingly so, is hinged upon our cooperation, yea, our desire. Such is the case with the Holy Spirit of God as it relates to God's people. For the fact of the matter is we have the capacity to quench the Holy Spirit of God and to grieve him not only our sin but our apathy and again when we think about the desire of the Holy Spirit of God the Spirit of truth we we have no doubt what he desires to establish in my heart again today is the truth 
And I pray, Lord, that I would not only cooperate with that, but that that would actually be a deep desire on my part. And then I pray that for your precious people in this place. Be our guide, our help. Do your great illuminating work, O Holy Spirit of God. As we open up the pages of your book, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our study in Titus continues. We are working our way through a section of the epistle, chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, where the great apostle Paul is speaking to young pastor Titus about the issue or the topic of false teachers and their false teachings. We come this morning to verse 14. Let's read. Let's pick up verse 13 with verse 14. So here we go, Titus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, this witness is true. It's referencing what was just said previous, that the Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. And here's verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't have read verse 13 because now i got to give you a leftover. Bad move. You remember the word sound at the end of verse 13 speaks of spiritual health, of being well spiritually. We're so often and sometimes rightfully so concerned about our physical health, but there is a greater issue, and it is our spiritual health, and so we're in the process of welcoming God's um, spirit stirring our hearts concerning the import of our spiritual health and well-being. And you recall that we said that spiritual health cannot be arrived at nor maintained apart from our engaging the book that you're holding in your hands this morning, apart from our systematically regularly and even daily eating God's inscripturated word, the B-I-B-L-E. We noted that the word of God is our spiritual food, which produces, first of all, produces and then maintains spiritual health. By the way, I don't want to sidetrack you, but we perhaps are recognizing that there's truth to the well-known statement that you are what you eat. Now we understand, you know, the physical aspects of that and the lacking of such. I mean, if you, all you do is eat tomatoes, you're certainly not going to turn into a tomato. But I wonder if that was the case, what you would be. I, I would be probably a pretzel <laughs> and not any pretzel it would have to be Snyder's of Hanover hard sourdough pretzels with salt sorry or maybe I would be a deer or probably a chicken <laughs> or at least a chicken's egg well, I had all kinds of fun thinking about what you would be. <laughs> we are what we eat. The analogy, by the way, is not ours. It's God's. That you and I ought to be feasting on the inscripturated word of God. That we actually ought to be eating Christ's words. The word is our spiritual food. It's impossible for us to first arrive at spiritual health and then maintain it apart from our engaging, again, regularly and systematically and daily, God's word, not mine, the inscripturated word of God. Because we are going to continue to hover over this truth, I, I, I wanted to pause and quickly show you this is the leftover I, I want to quickly show you, I, I, I like the construction of our text because we get to see something with our 
physical eye, and I trust that we will be able to see it with our spiritual eye as well. It's a simple observation. It's centered around this word sound. In the Greek, hagiaino, spiritual health and well-being. Paul uses the word four times in his epistle to young pastor Titus. Each time that the word is used, we find it in a couplet that's significant. For instance, we read in verse 13 this. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound, there it is, that's our word, in the faith. Verse 13, if we capsulized it, we would say sound people, that they may be sound. Sound, spiritually healthy people. But how do you arrive at sound, spiritually healthy people? Well, again, the couplet. Take a look at verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound, what class? Doctrine. You show me sound people, and I'll show you someone who is feeding on sound doctrine. Sound doctrine leads to sound people. And if you think that I'm reading too much into this, take a look at the other time that we find the couplet. This time, these two things brought very close together, not just by Paul, but because he's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God by the Holy Spirit of God. Take a look at the first two verses of chapter 2. But speak thou... The things which become sound doctrine, I've actually circled it in my Bible. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, and guess what? Sound. Sound doctrine leads to sound people. We really are what we eat, especially spiritually. Boy, someone ought to preach on that. Now verse 14, I'm reading. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. As you might expect, the verb here is very significant. This phrase, giving heed, at the beginning of the verse is very significant. It's the Greek word prosecho, I note that with you because we've heard these, uh, th- this is obvious, obviously a compound word in the Greek, but we've heard uh, the, the primitive parts of the word before. Once again, we're confronted with a preposition, pros, it's one of your favorite, to move toward. Pros means to move toward, and echo means to hold, hold. Oh. And so it's the idea that you would move toward, this is so significant, I, I wish you would tone down your excitement just a little bit this morning, it's a big distraction to me. <clears throat> this is so exciting, it's the, it's the idea that you, we might as well make proper application, that you move toward something or someone And when you get there, this is sort of a Tommy Teal rendering. It's you moving towards someone or something, and when you get there, you embrace it, you hold it. You got the idea? I I can demonstrate it for you positively. I have to tell you, because I'm not good at this, I have to tell you that I'm pretending to be a robot. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> You're dismissed. <laughs> Pros, toward. And when you get there, what class? Hold, hold, hold. Now let me show you something else, and this is where you really can be dismissed. Another aspect of the term that's awesome. Now how do I do this and, and catch the movement? God's painting the picture, not me. Catch the movement and catch the emotion. I mean true emotion. I mean things like love. I mean like unconditional sacrificial love. Catch the movement and the 
emotion of the term. And then note something else about the term that is awesome. I make my move. I probably should have worded that a little bit differently. <laughs> I move. I come toward. I embrace. And then invariably, the thing that you embrace will in turn embrace you. I'm serious. <laughs> Give me just a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you youngsters, you really shouldn't be seeing stuff like that. <laughs> so that's a demonstration of what the word means from a good standpoint. Giving heed, remember now the term, the phrase giving heed. That's a demonstration of what the word means from a good standpoint, but... Here in our text, we have the term used and couched within a negative uh, backdrop, drop, the idea that it works both for good and for bad. And of course, when everything is said and done, what's at, what, what's at the topic here this morning is not so much my love and devotion to Anne, but my love and devotion to God and to the things of God and to the word of God. That I would be with emotion moving toward something. And when I get there, hold it knowing that more than likely what I hold will in turn hold me back. I want to step back just a moment before we get real specific here, and, and, and that is please know and note with me this morning that you and I are giving heed to something. May I say that again? The question is not whether or not you and I are giving heed to someone or something. We are. The question is, to whom are we giving heed? To what are we giving heed? And note something else with me, a little bit of grammar. The verb here is in the present tense, and you know this well. See, we don't have to be Greek scholars to understand and appreciate some of the beautiful nuances of truth forthcoming from Greek. Golden nuggets, some of you have deemed. The verb is in the present tense, which signals to us that this is not a one-time thing. In the positive realm, in regard to my approach to God, the things of God, and specifically the word of God, or the commandments of God, as Paul uh, describes and delineates here, God is not after, nor is he anticipating or looking for that this would be just a one-time thing. God's anticipating, it actually is true in the negative realm. In fact, that's what's going to become increasingly clear to us in regard to the people that Titus was dealing with on the island of Crete as they had given heed to Jewish fables and the commandments, not of God, but of men. It's actually a way of life. It's a pattern, again, both for good and for bad. And I don't know if you'll fully understand this or appreciate it, and if not, it's my fault, not yours, but... I need to say to you in regard to the day when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way we sang face to face with Christ my Savior, and what a great day that will be. But we understand that there's a day of reckoning coming even for God's people. It, it's called by the great apostle Paul the judgment seat of Christ. He references it in a number of his, of his epistles. It, it, it's important to Paul that the people that he's dealing with are conscious of and aware of this coming event. And I just want to say this to you, that in that day, 
It's not that it's not that every single thing that we do doesn't come into play because it does, but in that day, please understand with me a new and a fresh this morning that what's going to be at the heart of everything are the patterns of our life. The habits. Isn't it shameful that we've given the word over to Satan that the habits of our lives, things that we do over and over and over again, and we do it with emotion and with understanding and with desire, ought to be godly, God-pleasing, God-generated, God-glorifying. We, we ought to be people of habits. And, and I will tell you, and I didn't express it well, but I want you to hear it so that you can't say, I never heard it. That when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the focus is going to be on those things that we did faithfully. Do you hear the word faithfully? Well done, thou good and uh, faithful servant. Patterns. Habits. Ways of life. So who or what are you giving heed to. We all are giving heed to someone. We all are giving heed to something. And broadly, of course, and I'm glad we don't have to be rocket scientists in regard to this, we're, we're, we're either giving heed to God and his things or Satan and his things, but specifically and with a view to our text, we are either giving heed to fables or facts. We are either giving heed to falsehoods or the firmly seated truth of the inscripturated word of God. We are either giving heed to the commandments of men or the commandments of God. One or the other. I trust you're seeing this with me. All of life is summarized in this single compound Greek word and this clear English phrase translated therefrom. All of life is summed up in this word and phrase, giving heed. Who are you giving heed to? What are you giving heed to? It's, it's that important. And it's not a stretch to say that both our eternal destiny, where we will spend all of eternity. I remind you, by the way, that this earthly sojourn of yours and mine is so short that it's described by the God who breathed life into you physical as a vapor here today gone tomorrow. Who or what we give heed to, what weighs in the balance is our, is, is, is our eternal destiny, where we will spend all of eternity. And then for the child of God, the one who has gotten things straight by recognizing his need of Christ because of his sin and embracing Christ by faith and trust, as one's own personal savior. For that one, then, the question becomes, how well will it be? Greater joy for some than others. What are you holding? What do you really love? What do you find yourself drawn to, like, consistently and faithfully in your life? What are you holding, and what in turn is holding you? What are you and I giving heed 
too. I want to show you a couple of other places where this word is used. So keep your finger here. We're not going far. We're just turning back to 1 Timothy a few pages back. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Take a look. This is valuable. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Here we go. Now, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And guess what? There's our phrase in both the English and the Greek, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's bad. Let me, let me show you the good. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you get some good, sophisticated words from that Pastor Tom. Let me show you the good, verse 13 of the same chapter, 1 Timothy 4, 13. I love this. Ah, I can't believe it. Till I come, give attendance, there's our word, give heed, move with great emotion, devotion, commitment, move toward and then hold... Two. guess what the reading of God's word oh man how we like complicating everything and all the excuses that we think fly with God that in reality do not question can you read I'm serious. Can you read? Can you imagine, you know, we, we think, ah, oh, we're above all of these things, and then we're reading along. We've seen it before, but it's neat to visit it again. We're reading along, and all of a sudden, it's like that V8 commercial where the Spirit of God flops you on, the, on, on your forehead, and you're prompted to say, oh, I... For God, I ought to read. I, I could have read this morning. And young people, please understand this. I know a lot of our young people are gone, but we have some here and you're precious to us. Please understand this. I, I can guarantee this to you because it's based not upon my thinking, not upon my words, but God's. Please understand because, again, we... Every one of us, as we reflect back on our lives, especially as young people, we recognize that there was a time when we really struggled with our devotions. I'm sure Pastor Landon is just constantly touching base with our young people in regard to this. There was a time when we really struggled with our, young, uh, with our devotions, and, 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 you know, it was hard for us even to pick up the Bible, which, again, when you come a little bit further and walking with the Lord and you walk and you look back and you say how how could that ever be and, and can you believe that God he, he meets us right where we're at and the, here's the question can you read seriously are you old enough to read then God says read my book and here's what I want to give to you a guarantee again based upon God's word, especially Psalm 19 and not mine. I, I can guarantee this to you. A and I invite anyone to testify different than what I'm saying by way of your all experience, you, you old timers. That if we would obey God with the simple and first thing and just start reading his word, and if we would begin to prayerfully read his word. And if you demonstrate to God that you mean business. Something like God, even though it's difficult for me to do, you know, and tomorrow morning will probably be a struggle for me. But with your help, I'm making the commitment that every single day I'm going to read a portion of your book. It won't be long. It will not be long before you start digging up your golden nugget. And you move closer and closer and closer to the practical reality that this, 
these are the words of my life. Can you imagine that God's on an eternal record of saying to God's people, give heed to reading. Read. Read. You can read, right? Read. Read. Now it's the beginning, not the end. And that's good news too. But it starts there. Read. You see how we're without excuse, even a simple-minded man like Pastor Tom? Because believe it or not, I can read. Awesome. W one other text, Second Peter. We've got to do this very quickly. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Another place where we find this word used. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you, what class? Take heed. Take heed. As unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And we won't even read the whole verse, but go back to verse 16 where Paul, uh, where Peter appropriately joins Paul in saying, we have not followed cunningly devised, what class? Fables. We have got the truth of God's word. We don't have the commandments of men. We have the commandments of God. By the way, i got to pick and choose my, my way through here now. The, the word fable that we have here by Peter and uh, used by Paul in 1 Timothy and then in our text in Titus is the Greek word muthos. You can hear myths in it. A fictitious tale. Unreal, untrue, imaginary. Non-existence and at worst purposefully deceptive. Do you, do you see it? You, you and I, every single day, we choose between fables and fact. That's it. It's one or the other. And as our text goes on to say, we choose between the commandments of men and the commandments of God. One will turn you from the truth and the other will absolutely envelop you with truth. The commandments of God. And so the, in the end, and i got to let you go, we're once again brought to a place, our, I, I think Moses' words probably are appropriately ringing in our heads and in our hearts this morning. Choose you this day between fables and facts, between the commandments of men and the commandments of God. Choose between the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the father of lies. Choose between eternal life and eternal death. Choose between eternal reward for a life lived for Jesus in obedience to Jesus' word. And eternal loss of reward, even, and especially for God's people. Know this. What you hold will hold you. And what you give heed to and what you give hold to, which in turn holds you, determines everything in life. So... What are you holding to? Who's holding you? What are you giving heed to? And if your answer is anything other than Christ and his words, frankly, you are in trouble. See me. I got to let you go. See me. Come now. Catch me in just a moment. But don't leave here today apart from being assured in your heart that who you're giving heed to is the one and only Savior 
and then child of God, already saved, leave here today with me with a stronger determination to be giving practical heed day by day and even moment by moment to the truth. Heavenly Father, impress these things upon our hearts. May the word of God impact our lives even now we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand together again. Turn to hymn number 84. Page number 84 will sing just the first verse. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning, and we stand in awe of a God who saves and sanctifies and even sustains us. Lord, we just pray that you would give us the strength this week as we leave this building to daily move toward your word and embrace it, that we may know the difference between truth and fables, where we get sidetracked at times, but uh, as Pastor Tom has reminded us, it's simple. Uh, your word is truth, and it's, it's, uh, it's as simple as that. We just must live by it. Lord, give us the strength and the wisdom. Allow your spirit to work in us. In Jesus' name, amen.